Hi everybody, uh, another screen side chat coming your way. Uh, we have uh, learned some things in the past couple of weeks. We've been keeping a close eye on the discussion forums. Uh, one thing that we've all learned is that you all like to know where our eyes are going while we're giving the screen side chats. <laughs> so sometimes we may be looking at the camera, sometimes we may be looking at each other. But we also realize that um, it's fair enough for you to point it out. None of us had, have had acting lessons. We're all brand new at this. So we appreciate the coaching. It helps us. Uh, and, though, and also, this is maybe a time to just mention on the discussion forum, there's a little bit of punchiness out there, a little bit of, uh, what do we say in soccer, Th things are getting a little chippy sometimes out there. And I would just say to those of you who are feeling um, annoyed by whatever you perceive as some chippiness out there on the discussion forums, just take a breath. It's okay. You know, mostly what's happening out there is there are tens of thousands of people exchanging great ideas about the stories. There are a handful of a dozen or may maybe more out of the tens of thousands that are being a little chippy and you know let's let it go it's just not gonna ruin our day and it's surely not ruining our day um, I've noticed that uh, some of the responses to the chippiness out there are hey they're really trying hard and I really appreciate that I feel like we've got some great fans out there and I, I don't know that we've earned that but I really appreciate that you all are kind of circling the wagons to help us but I would just also reassure everybody I've got a thick skin all of us have thick <laughs> skins We've taught a lot. Uh, I'm used to students falling asleep in front of me. I'm used to other ones standing up and saying, are you sure about that? It doesn't seem right. And that's okay. And, and we'll just keep being as respectful as almost all of you, as I said last time, 99.9% .9 of you have been being. And that's great. And that's all we can ask for. And in the meantime, don't let any of that other stuff get in the way of what's really amazing here, which is our stories. I mean, look at what we're reading. We're reading Virgil. Um, soon to be reading Ovid. We've read the tragedies. And we've got some great stuff to talk about. So we wanted to spend most of our time today, uh, sure, looking in different directions. Uh, but also, we wanted to spend uh, some time uh, talking about uh, the substance of what's out there and some of the great stuff you guys have been raising on the discussion forum. Uh, so, turning it over to the teaching team, uh, oh, and we'll just introduce ourselves one more time in case we need to. Peter Strzok, Carrie Lowry, Caroline Whitbeck, and Kat Gillespie. So, hi again. And who, who will start? Uh, I think I get to start today. And okay. I had one note that I wanted to clarify. I think uh, it's come up in a lot of different forums and some of these different discussions, and that's the idea of trilogies. Uh, so we wanted to just uh, point out that the, all of these plays are, of course, part of a trilogy. That during the city Dionysia, you have three poets who get to kind of strut their stuff. Uh, each poet presents three tragedies plus a satyr play on one day, um, and we go on for three days like this. So if you consider the Oresteia is the one surviving trilogy we have, um, from 458. It's our um, earliest and our only complete surviving trilogy of Aeschylus. When we talk about the Oedipus story, Oedipus the king or Oedipus uh, Tyrannus, Antigone and Oedipus at Colonus are all part of that myth, but they are not part of the same <coughs> performance context. Exactly. So I think one of the things that has come out is that uh, Oedipus the King is performed probably around 427 after there is an actual plague in Athens, maybe in response to that plague. Uh, some scholars have even compared Oedipus to a sort of Periclean figure, uh, like that actual Athenian statesman. So that is, has a very particular performance context. Uh, Historically, it actually comes after Antigone, right? So there's the idea that Antigone is performed about 10 years prior to that play, and then Oedipus at Colonus is not performed until around 401 after Sophocles uh, has died. So it's actually a, a posthumous performance. If you're thinking about Oedipus um, dying or going to this place, Colonus, where Sophocles was from, uh, and you're thinking about this as pro maybe one of the last plays he wrote, uh, that has a very different sort of feeling. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, and um, so we want to think about that, and then we want to think about Bacchae is, you know, 406, 405, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so also one of the last plays Euripides wrote. Uh, so they all have a, a span from 458 to 401 when these plays are being performed. They're all part of trilogies, it's just we don't have those trilogies. So uh, be very conscious of where we're making those separations between performance context 
the years of performance, what Athens is going through, uh, the course of a very tumultuous century, uh, <laughs> and there is a huge time gap uh, between those. So I just wanted to remind ourselves uh, that, that, that those are some of the matters we want to take into consideration when we're putting forth our interpretations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay. That's great. <coughs> well, um, so a couple of people have flagged um, this issue of rootedness and autochthony, um, also tying it in with blood relations and, and just um, the sense of too closeness. Um, for example, An Anthony DiMartini, um, if you're out there watching. Um, and this is especially at play um, in Oedipus. Uh, so for Oedipus, he literally cannot escape where he was born. His, um, he can't escape his motherland, and he can't escape his mother. Um, those, are, <laughs> those are very much linked. Um, so it's sort of like a, um, um, a boomerang effect. So he tries to go out and escape, and he's drawn back. Um, and actually, um, Levi Strauss linked this uh, rootedness with the lameness of the Labdicid family. So all of the Labdicids, uh, from Labdicus, Laius, Oedipus on, they all have problems with their feet. Um, they either are lame, they walk with a limp, they have swollen feet, or they have pinned feet. Um, and this is really a, a sort of tangible um, tie that they are linked to the land. Um, they can't get too far away, they can't stray. Um, and um, this is also, some other scholars have, um, have flagged this as, um, as sort of an underdetermination of blood relation um, in tension with an overdetermination of blood relations. Um, and, and this lameness is really sort of a vestigial reminder of, of where, um, where someone comes from. So autochthony being born from the land versus uh, being um, arriving in the land from without. Um, and you can also see here uh, links with um, um, being born from two parents, actual human parents, a male versus a female parent, versus just sort of springing up um, from the land like a, like a plant, like a sapling. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely keep those in mind um, when, when you read um, about Oedipus and, and um, yeah, just kind of. So in that, that. In that <clears throat> iteration of autochthony yeah. that, uh, that we see Sophocles using, there's on the one hand a sense that people may just spring up out of the ground versus the other one people come from uh, sexual union. Uh, so individuals have parents behind them. Other humans are the, are, are the producers of humans. Mm -hmm. um, and the messiness of that uh, scenario versus the sort of cleanliness mm -hmm. of just pluck, being plucked out of the ground is something I think that does keep mm -hmm. echoing back and forth uh, in this family. And there, I noticed some further discussion in the forums about uh, lame-footedness mm -hmm. as a marker of aristocracy and, and, and a kind of autochthonous birth. And there was some further investigation of both the, the Jason missing his sandal mm -hmm. and Achilles having a bad, uh, bad heel. Uh, all just right on the, uh, I, you know, right in that same line. Now, in n none of these cases is it explicit sort of tie to autochthony, but we can see a residual uh, expression mm -hmm. of heroes having lame feet. Uh, that is tied to autochthony in enough places where we make a suggestion that all of them are tied to autochthony, and it makes a certain amount of sense. You got to pick them out of the ground, and when you do, you break the feet off the off the root. And coming out of um, some of these negotiations of born from parents, born from the land that we already see that's causing a lot of the tension, or at least Levi Strauss would have causing some of this tension here, uh, Wang Chao actually flagged what for me was a very interesting, I don't want to call it quite structuralist binary, but a, a conflict between, you know, the, in terms of what was driving Oedipus, uh, between words and deeds. And I know there's been a lot of discussion, and there'll continue to be a lot of discussion, and we talked a little bit in the lectures um, about fate and, you know, how the, the words of the oracle um, are, you know, one category against what people do in response to the oracle. And there's been a lot of really great conversation around that. What I thought was interesting to revisit, thinking about um, words and deeds and sort of the, the various slip, slippages and disjunctures is how it ties into the way the play actually unfolds. Because as several people have also said, you know, how it is that you feel these sympathies when you, you know, you're hearing all these stories. I think it's worth considering the words and the deeds in terms of the, the broader arc of this play. Um, as we said, we think this may have been uh, staged after a play contemporaneous, roughly contemporaneous in Athens. And the play opens at the point of a second plague. So already you're in a situation that's got to repeat. Um, you're already, we talked in Epic a lot, you're in Medias Rest. This is a certain point 
um, where something is happening again. Mm -hmm. And I know our translator talked a lot about how that becomes ironic mm -hmm. with all the messages that get heard and not heard and acted and not acted on. Um, and it's, you know, he, our, our, our translator explicitly links that to a disjuncture. He says, I think it's very nice to consider between uh, sort of the irony or the tragedy of the situation and the romance, which is, and you think about what that would mean. If it's the romance, it's the child that gets lost and then reunited with his parents. Well, imagine if this had played out chronologically. It would be a very different story if the deeds were coming the way the deeds are without all these switchbacks from how things are told almost against the action. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, if we want to think about what tragedies are doing, it's working a lot in this sort of this friction between these textures of storytelling and performance um, and the historical or chronological register mm -hmm. um, that I think is, is just worth for considering. I thought Wang Chao's comment was so interesting to draw our attention to the way sort of an oracle provides a crisis point for those, those vectors. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, that's a great point, and I would say that there's always a tension between how words either translate into deeds or how words uh, are matched or unmatched yes. by deeds. That some of the people on the forums have actually brought up this idea of sophistry or the <laughs> sophists who, of course, try and make a lesser argument into a stronger, um, who don't always match their words with a moral or a ideal sort of action. So that gets translated into tragedy, often through this figure of actually Odysseus. <laughs> our well-known polytropos yes. uh, figure whose words are always more persuasive in, say, the Philoctetes, another Sophoclean play that we don't look at in this class, but that has kind of a, a lot to do with those themes. Um, I wanted to, actually talking about words and, and deeds, I wanted to talk a little bit about one specific word uh, and how it kind of translates onto the stage. Uh, so we were talking about the Bacchae this week. Uh, we've talked a little, a lot about disguises, about changes, about uh, wearing the wearing of masks, <laughs> about the changing of one's identity uh, on stage, and in order to witness something, perhaps you're not supposed to see. So one of the words that I wanted to just draw out is the word prosopon, mm -hmm. uh, which of course can mean a mask. Right, it's someone's face, it's their visage, mm -hmm. but it can as also be the mask that these actors are wearing. Uh, so we have, uh, according to the rules of tragedy, you're only allowed three actors, of course, for one of these plays. So in Bacchae, mm -hmm. the, actor, uh, the actor who plays Pentheus actually takes off that mask and then plays the part of Agave, his mother, which is one of the one <coughs> most wonderful, I think, uh, inversions that happens is then this actor who's now wearing the mask of agave comes mm -hmm. screaming onto the stage saying, I have the prosopon <laughs> of yeah. a lion, which is actually the mask that she used, that this actor's, that actor used to wear as Pentheus. Mm -hmm. So she's running in saying, here's the mask of Pentheus. It is indeed <laughs> a mask of Pentheus. Um, and this within the world of the play, it's uh, agave saying, I have the head of a lion. Mm -hmm. So you have this kind of meta-theatrical moment mm -hmm. that I think is one of the most powerful ways that we get a reminder that this is a tragedy. Mm -hmm. Welcome to my Dionysiac world. Yeah. Welcome to my world of the stage. Um, so you kind of get these specific words that point us towards seeing those meta-theatrical moments. Uh, so that was one word uh, yeah. and one deed that I wanted to draw our attention and I, to. I think that's really interesting um, because in, in, in that moment, if you think about what that would be like, that Pentheus becomes agave, it becomes his own, her own in doing. We see so many you know, points around which Dionysus is that pivot point. I think some, several people actually said that Dionysus is the structuralist binary, right. which, which I thought everyone thought was really great. So a couple of you pointed that out. We're having a good time with that. Um, in a funny way, thinking about agave <coughs> pentheus, it, almost, you know, it, it, it starts to see, seem like you, know, you see the tragic figure in that character because the point being they're their own undoing in a way that we mm -hmm. see in Oedipus. And looking at the two of them alongside each other, maybe this is my own perverse reading, I start to see parallels yeah. um, with, you know, as I said earlier, the doubling that's happening to give Oedipus its tension, this second plague that's going to prove mm -hmm. itself to be the undoing of all this goodness that came when you came for the first plague, and now the second plague, we're going to go right back in that really sickening circle. And then Pentheus, when he's at that point of seeing what he should not be seeing, um, and he sees literally double. I see two sons, I see two Thebes. 
And for me, and I know some people have been talking about Jocasta and when does Jocasta know, it's also the mothers. Um, the difficult, upsetting, they, they pivot around the mother, whether it's Jocasta who, you know, who is sort of the point around which and on which and through which this whole thing <laughs> happens, um, or the fact of, of agave. Um, and that, that really, oh, it just, it, it wrenches me when Dionysus says, you, I, you will be carried home in your mother's yeah. arms, yeah. which is quite, you know, just gives you chills yeah. when you know what that actually means. Um, so I, I'm interested in seeing, you know, if, if we want to think about Dionysus as being um, uh, sort of a key, as, as we've seen in some performances, to the female. Some people start mm -hmm. thinking of the, the androgyny we mm -hmm. see, and Kat gave us a fabulous link to uh, a 2008 <coughs> uh, performance in Scotland that was later at Lincoln Center where Alan Cumming, fabulous androgynous Alan Cumming, um, plays Dionysus with a head of what one reviewer called Shirley Temple Curls. Um, you know, really living it up. Yeah. Um, so thinking about the, you know, the female and, and the mother. We've, we've yeah. seen this with Demeter. We spent some time in the hymns thinking about the female experience, and I think this might be an interesting time to re-examine where it comes up again, I think very explicitly through Bacchae, but then it allows you to read it back into sort of Jocasta's experience mm -hmm. in Oedipus, and how that, you know, all those three together might <coughs> give you a negotiation for this, this, this fertile, difficult, dangerous person of the female and the mother. Um, in these families. Well, it's really interesting, too, that um, in the Bacchae, <coughs> we see um, really a profusion of parents. I mean, we see the twice-born Dionysus. He has too many parents, and yes. he's born too many times. And then we see the, the regression and the, the too few parents um, in the Oedipus play. Mm -hmm. So Oedipus's children have too few parents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. Although in he way. himself yeah. has yes. too many, right. yeah. Yeah. and Dionysus needs to prove his parents, which exactly. is why he's doing this at all. Um, right. Right. So it's, yeah. very, it's very messy when one starts to mm -hmm. contemplate one's origin point, however mm -hmm. one does that. And we see that played out in both of these tragedies that we've read this week. Um, and I also wanted to, um, to flag what Linda Peck um, started. Uh, speaking of Dionysus and sort of um, ambiguity and role reversal, um, she started a civilized versus uncivilized thread um, about Dionysus as an anomalous god in, in many ways. So he has a share in the Olympian, and he also has a share in the Chthonic. Um, he's from the East. He's sort of the opposite of Autochthonus. Um, he's not rooted in Greek soil. Um, he's always the god who arrives from somewhere else. And every time he arrives, he brings his rights, and he um, begs um, and compels people to, to worship him. Um, so he always is, is coming into the polis from without, and then he takes people from the polis and <laughs> takes them out to the wilderness. Um, so there is an inversion of many traditional forms of Greek religion, uh, such as sacrifice. So instead of sacrificing um, during the day, sacrificing a, um, a cow or, or something like that, uh, we see the, the total ripping apart of uh, wild animals outside of a civic context, um, not on a, a, a civilized altar, but out in the woods, uh, limb from limb, that's the sparagmos. Um, and we also see not the cooking of, um, of sacrificial meat, but um, eating of, of raw flesh, the um, homophagia. Um, we don't see sort of uh, libations that are, um, that are poured uh, to the god and, and things that go up. Instead, we see libations <laughs> that are poured into the ground of sort of these visceral fluids mm -hmm. of milk and honey and, and wine and, and things like that, um, and eventually blood uh, that goes down into the ground. Um, so, you know, and also Dionysus, uh, the fact that he's called, um, he has this dual um, role is both, both the most gentle, the gentlest to mankind, and the most harmful. Um, so the gentlest in that he brings wine, which causes sweet sleep and, and cure from all ailments, um, and it sort of puts you in a lull. And then the, the underbelly of, of that same um, substance can also drive people to, obviously, madness and ecstasis. Um, so, you know, um, all of you who are flagging this, this very, um, very dualistic and very sort of um, fraught nature of Dionysus, uh, you're right, right to do so. And that reminds me a little bit, there's a, a famous uh, contemporary American cartoon, and I'll just leave it at that, that has the main characters say that uh, alcohol is oh. the solution to and cause of all of life's problems. Um, mm -hmm. It is not that far afield from the <laughs> kind of theme that we see uh, pulled out with Dionys Dionysus and his wine. <clears throat> As college campuses, <laughs> most places also. Yeah, 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 we run into those. Yeah. 
Um, well, not to bring us away too far from Dionysus, yeah. but it seems we've uh, given a little bit of short shrift to Oedipus, our mm. uh, tyrant or our king. And I wanted to come back. Uh, last screen side chat, we introduced Aristotle and his poetics, his definition of tragedy. I wanted to come back to Aristotle <coughs> and his idea that Oedipus in Sophocles' as Oedipus the King is the quintessential or the ideal of his definition of the tragic hero, right? So this is someone who's well-constructed as a character. It's someone who is uh, larger or greater or better than, say, the audience perceives themselves. Uh, he is someone who elicits these responses of pity and fear. He is someone who... Um, say, has this hamartia, right, which he, he misses the mark in mm -hmm. some way, right? He has this, um, I don't want to call it a flaw, but an <laughs> error. This error, error. his error. error. Uh, error. And uh, <laughs> he is someone who, in whose life the anagnorisis and the peripatia or the recognition and reversal mm -hmm. happen at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. They're very complementary, and they happen at the same time in the play. And while I wanted to put it out there, do we think that do we agree with Aristotle that he is the quintessential uh, hero in these tragedies, or uh, are there flaws? <laughs> are there <laughs> flaws in the flaws model? in yeah. that model, or in or in Aristotle's <coughs> argument? I mean, I'm how do we define? Start on this, but I'll be interested in what all of you have to say. The uh, the Aristotelian definition of tragedy. It's very readable for those of you who haven't already read it, and I know lots of you out there already have. Uh, but reading Aristotle's Poetics is a an amazing experience. You, you kind of get it the first time you read it, and you get it a lot more every other time you read it after that. Probably, uh, you know, in, until until the end of your own life. It's unbelievably approachable and yet also uh, dense and, uh, and profound. So the uh, characterization of tragedy, uh, interestingly, as uh, um, uh, just as uh, Kat's pointing out here, it relies on a couple of very technical notions. And one, uh, we talked about recognition and reversal. That's important. These need to come close together for Aristotle in the sequence of uh, the great tragic figure. A tragic figure needs to be highborn and brought low. That's important too. You can't be low and brought high. That that doesn't work for tragedy. You've got to be highborn and brought low. Um, <clears throat> then this idea of a hamartia. Uh, I noticed that came up on the boards as well, which is uh, it's great. It shows you know it shows a, a, a real engagement and. Um, the way that this gets translated into Elizabethan tragedy, f from Aristotle in fact, is as a flaw, which means that there's some built-in character defect of a hero that causes the hero's problems. Um, that's not quite what Homer had, or what uh, Aristotle had in mind though. Um, from Shakespeare and forward, that's kind of how it's been processed through uh, the history of tragedy. But in classical antiquity and in uh, Aristotle's view of things, it's not a, an, in, an in, innate uh, defect of character, it's a mistake. Hamartia means missing the mark. Uh, so the, the, the figure, um, it's not obvious that you know, there's some uh, uh, clear uh, fatalistic endpoint that someone like an Oedipus is gonna come to. Instead, Oedipus comes to this end, and he comes to an end because there's a missing of the mark that happened along the way. That may be morally fraught, it may not be. Uh, it may be reflective of deeper character uh, defects. It may not be. Uh, so th there's a certain amount of, uh, chance is probably too strong a word, but a certain amount of, um, uh, of the, the complexity of life that Aristotle's theory acknowledges uh, that is necessary, I think, for us to bring out. And yeah, I, I would say if, if I were, uh, if, you know, if the, the idea is that we should all kind of uh, lay it down, I'm, I'm not going to disagree with Aristotle. Uh, I'll go out on a limb and agree with Aristotle mm -hmm. uh, and uh, say that, yeah, I mean, who's going to do more than Oedipus to show us what a uh, tragic character is all about? Uh, but I, it, I think someone should get extra points if they could disagree with Aristotle. Oh. The one, well, the one play yeah. I would look to for maybe a challenge is actually Antigone. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, in my own thinking about this play, I'm not convinced that uh, that it's really should be called Antigone and not Creon. <laughs> I actually see Creon as, uh, and I know we didn't assign this play, but I, I encourage everyone to read it, that Creon has that same sort of experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that play, he really loses everything. Mm -hmm. And he, it's not only that he loses the respect of his people, he loses his place as the new tyrant mm -hmm. <laughs> after Oedipus, 
but he loses his wife, he loses his son, he loses his soon-to-be daughter-in-law, he loses really everything and becomes uh, someone who is so isolated in a state of kind of social and psychological aramia that mm -hmm. you might say that I, I would put him out there as another potential. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not quite as dramatic, yeah. maybe, uh, as, yeah. as the blinding, uh, but he is just as blind in a lot of ways. And he's got all those other features uh, from high to low and mm -hmm. the closeness of the mm -hmm. um, recognition true. and reversal and interesting, yeah. yeah. But it is funny because it is displaced. If you want to think of what makes Oedipus so compellingly mm -hmm. tight is that it's, it's claustrophobic to the point where it's in his, in his self mm -hmm. and in Antigone the claustrophobia is <laughs> someone else's to have unfortunately. It's Antigone's, right. you know, it's yeah, almost yeah. like that's that's the, the, the sense of the buried alive is sort of what's, what I think is coming out in Oedipus yeah. that may make yeah. that, and then there, it's there, it's just slightly off center. Yeah. Um, but I like, I like calling it Creon, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sold on that reading. Yeah. Um, that, that idea of burying alive is nice uh, in Antigone, we, play we haven't read, but it focuses centrally on what you're supposed to do with a dead body. Uh, Creon insists that there's certain things that shouldn't be done with uh, the, the dead body ought not to be buried because it would be an offense. This is a traitor or a traitorous uh, person. But uh, there's a larger law that wins out in the end. Um, but it, in, in the end, there's a, a burying alive, which is a suffocation, closeness, all the intimacy that we've been talking about that just falls in on itself. Not, not good. And in a way, she was already buried, buried. alive before she was even yeah. born by virtue of a her parents. <laughs> so. Yeah. 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 so, all uh, we got through every single Some thing to say about tragedy. Some food for thought. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. That's tragedy in a nutshell. Heartwarming. Oh, right. Food for thought. There nice to see you all again. Hope you have another good week and uh, that Virgil treats you well. Good luck with your writing assignments. Uh, they'll be due this upcoming Sunday. Uh, and uh, uh, hope all's going well out in your part of the world. Uh, we'll see you one more screenside chat uh, before the class is all done. Best of luck with the reading. All right. Enjoy. Good luck all. Thanks a lot. Bye.